Welcome to episode 58 of I Thought I Knew How, a podcast about knitting and life and all sorts. I'm your host, Anne Frost, and this episode was recorded on May 24th, 2021. It was also recorded a few days before that because I have an interview for you today. I'm talking to Dana Blair of Pachinku Fibers. Some of you probably remember Pachinku from the second online international fiber festival in which they were vendors representing Peru. It's a fascinating talk about the business and preserving local crafting techniques. And Dana and I can talk for hours, so let's just get started. Before we begin, I'd like to welcome Roxy and Laura as producers slash patrons. Patrons keep the bills paid and receive some benefits in return. Learn more by hopping over to patreon.com slash I thought I knew how. Patrons waiting for stitch markers. I am a little behind on those, I just realized, and I do apologize for that, but I hope to get those in the mail this week for those who are expecting some of those. I am back from Peru. It was an incredible trip. I am going to be putting together a special video about the trip that will be out when it is out. I will be working on that a few hours a day, and when it's ready, I'll be sure to let you all know. It was an interesting experience being in Peru. They have opened up their tourism, but there are still a lot of precautions in place. We had to be COVID tested before and after arrival, and then again before we left. Anytime we entered a building store or attraction, we had our temperatures taken and our hands were sprayed with alcohol and we had to walk over a disinfecting mat. Large enclosed areas required double masks and face shields. But all of that said, we still managed to have quite the adventure and we got a lot of it on tape, including the visit to Pachinku Fibers, where we had permission to record a natural dyeing workshop. It was a fascinating experience, and Pachinko is doing incredible work bringing traditional dye methods to a wider audience, which is helping create a demand that will incentivize the preservation of those methods for years to come. Before we head into the interview, though, a reminder that I am hosting two tours to Shetland in August. Mac and our way through Shetland Fair Isle is nearly full. So if you sign up with a friend and are willing to share a room with two twin beds in it, we can fit in a few more people. Mac and Our Way Through Shetland Lace has a few more spaces available. Learn more about both tours through the link in the show notes or visit ithoughtiknewhow.com slash Shetland. I am so thrilled about the enthusiastic response to these tours, and I'm really looking forward to spending some time with some listeners geeking out about knitting techniques and history in one of my favorite parts of the planet. Honestly, nearly every trip I've been on to Shetland has been with my husband, and while he is supportive and enjoys visiting Shetland for his own reasons, he just does not get as ridiculously thrilled by a special piece of lace or the color blending on an exceptional piece of Fair Isle. So please come join us. I need to geek out with some people. (laughs) Again, the website is I thought I knew how.com slash Shetland or look for the link in the show notes. All this planning for the event has me realizing just how much I have been missing knitting lace and Shetland lace has so many little clever construction techniques to it that I was able to start learning about at that first wool week I went to in 2019. And I found myself itching to cast on a Shetland lace project the other day. So I went digging And I found a pattern I already owned for the Lauren Shawl by Gudrun Johnston. It starts by knitting a large triangle and garter stitch, which is where I am now in the process. Unlike a lot of styles of knitting with Shetland lace, when you're going to pick up along the border of an object, when you work your increases, you increase before working the first stitch of the row by working a yarn over before knitting the first stitch. Basically, you bring the yarn from front to back over the needle before knitting that first stitch, and by knitting that first stitch, you lock in a loop at the start of the row. And then when it comes time to pick up stitches along the edge, you then have all these lovely big obvious loops that you pick up onto your needle and then you knit back across over all of those loops. It is so easy and such an elegant, quick fix created by lace knitters who were knitting for production and needed to be fast about it. Honestly, if you have been intimidated by lace in the past, learning from a Shetlander is the way to go. There are so many little methods they figured out to make it more manageable. 
New Haven has just started their spring into summer shawl knit along. To participate, purchase three hanks of yarn and a shawl pattern from Knit New Haven with a 10% off discount and post progress photos to Facebook or Instagram. There are details in their blog post at knitnewhaven.com, so be sure to check that out. I'm casting on the Tarjuin cowl with the Morehouse Merino flock a few weeks late. But that's okay because all of the lessons and instructions are right there in the group waiting for me when I have the time. That is one of the perks of the new system that Erin has set up for the flock. You can sign up and just be a member or you can look for a project you'd like to do and sign up for a month and get all the help you need, including the individual lessons along the way, but also receive access to personal help and community support. 30 days of support for less than the price of most online classes. Find out more at morehousemerinoflock.com. Quite a few of you are working your way through the Woolland 100-Day Dress Challenge. It seems like it comes in waves, like four or five of you do it, and then as you're finishing, four or five other people join in. I love seeing how you are styling your dresses. Wool Ann creates wool blend dresses that are stylish, comfortable, and yes, cool enough to wear through the summer. I was at Oyai Taitambo the other day in my black Rowena dress, and I had a light jacket on, and as the day heated up, I ditched the jacket, but I was worried that the black dress would absorb more heat than the wool could release from my body, and that turned out not to be the case. I was cool as a cucumber and comfortable despite being dressed in black in full sunshine. They have shirts now too, as well as a few more legging styles. Have a look and try wearing one of the dresses for 100 days in a row to receive $100 off your next purchase. I started my challenge almost a year ago now, and I still basically wear the three dresses I own in rotation six to seven days a week. (laughs) They're just too comfortable. Look for the link in the show notes or click the link that says be a booster at ithoughtiknewhow.com. And if you do decide to purchase, you will be helping support the show. Okay, despite wanting to be quick and get to the interview, I still had a lot to say, so let's get to the interview. Dana Blair is the head of Pachinku Fibers, a company she started several years ago now in the Cusco, Peru area. From their dye workshop, they hand dye and supply yarn shops on five of the six continents that have yarn stores. The dyers, Santusa, Angela, and Leonarda, have been dyeing and weaving for years and using their experience and knowledge of local dye stuffs to create a lovely color palette on wool, baby alpaca, and cotton yarns. Learning from Dana and Santusa at the dye workshop was an incredible experience, and I look forward to sharing the video with you. But in the meantime, please enjoy this visit with Dana to learn more about why she started Pachinku Fibers, how they operate, and what they hope to achieve for the future of fiber crafts in the Sacred Valley of Peru. Dana, thank you for coming and meeting me in my hotel room. (laughs) Would you like to tell people where you're from, how you got started in crafting, and then we'll take it from there. Absolutely. I feel like I'm not as uh, I'm not as well qualified in terms of crafting and, and fiber arts as I should be, but it goes to show that you don't need to know everything about a business to create mm-hmm. a business, that you don't need to know about every cog and, and wheel of the machine. Um, so I'm originally from Hawaii. Uh, my parents are from California and Hawaii. I grew up in Pittsburgh and I went to school at Penn State and I was an anthropology major. Uh, I came to Peru for the first time working on an archaeological uh, excavation in, I think it would be the Central Andes. I always think that it's farther north than it actually Uh is, but it's a site called Chavin de Wanda. It's actually really well well known within anthropology circles, of course, and the project is um, co-managed by Stanford University and um, the Ministry of Culture here in Peru. So that was kind of my introduction to textiles to uh, Peruvian culture that I had taken an Andean archaeology course at Penn State, which took me to excavate in Peru. What is special about that site then? Well, it was more, uh, there's, a, there's a funny personal story behind it, but I'm, I'm always up for a challenge. And the professor of this course, of this Andean archaeology course, told us on the very first day that nobody was going to get an A. <laughs> it was impossible to get an A in his course. Well, of course, I bristled at that. And I went to his office hours and I told him, I am going to get an A. I'm going to get the highest grade in your course. And then I want you to help me get an internship because I was about to graduate an internship in Peru. Mm-hmm. And throughout the course, we studied a lot of different 
um, cultures, archaeological sites, uh, which were in active excavation, which weren't. And I particularly took an interest in Chavin, that was one of the originating cultures in Peru and gave rise to a lot of cults that we see along the coast and even here mm -hmm. to Cusco. But it was interesting that at the time I thought that Portuguese and Spanish were very similar languages and they're not. So I came speaking Portuguese, learned Spanish on the go. Wow. Uh, but I was looking at textiles from an archaeological perspective, so mm -hmm. uh, visiting a lot of museums and, of course, learning from the team at Chavin, uh, which is in the state of Ancash, north of Lima. Uh, when I got back to the States later that year, I was working at the Pittsburgh Museum of, um, well, I was working at the Anthropology Archives at the Museum of Natural History. And I just happened to apply to a job working for a nonprofit based here in Cusco. Mm -hmm. I'd been to Cusco. I honestly wasn't that thrilled by it. I didn't even go to Machu Picchu on that visit. I was on a backpacker's budget. I think I had, like, <laughs> after all necessary expenses, like $5 a day that I could do anything else with. Um, but I took the job with Threads of Peru, a nonprofit that works with textiles. And that's where I learned basically everything about mm -hmm. natural dyes, about uh, backstrap looms, uh, Quechua culture, Cusco. Um, I don't know if we want to jump into how that led to Pichinku, but that was... Sure, so that was sort of your jumping off That point. was the foundation, yeah. absolutely. And, and working with textiles was an extraordinary experience. I was really paying rent to not be in an apartment in Cusco, but I was always traveling. Uh, Threads worked at the time with nine communities, nine different weaving cooperatives around Cusco. So I would be out in Ausongate in the mountain range for a few days or in Oriente Tambo in the communities there going over the mountains to more. Mm -hmm. It was a really exciting, very dynamic, very hands-on And what was the nature of the work that you were doing with these groups? So I was working as an intermediary, essentially. So I am an anthropologist and I'm very interested in cultural, social anthropology, so mm -hmm. living, breathing humans that are part of the cultural practices or the, the practitioners of those cultural traditions mm -hmm. that I would study. Uh, what I was more interested in though was finding practical economic solutions to preserving those traditions. Because as we talked about the other day, if there is not some financial incentive to practicing, it can't be a hobby anymore. Yeah. It used to be utilitarian and now it can't be a hobby. If there is a way to make an income off of it, those practices stand a chance of surviving. Right. So I was working as an intermediary between these weaving groups um, that the majority were backstrap boom weavers, uh, taking their textiles to an international market. So developing the product, uh, improving quality control, understand, um, improving understanding of colorways, of of design trends that it still stayed very much within the um, the traditional pieces that mm -hmm. they would be making but having a little bit more of a connection with what modern consumers like you and I would be interested in purchasing. Yes and that's something you see a lot there's a lot of um, vendors one-on-one -on -one vendors you know who will approach you when you're on the street here mm -hmm. and a lot of the time what they try to sell you is not necessarily what appeals to well i'm you know speaking as me yes. it's not necessarily what appeals to me the colors or the design or something and i'm like looking over their shoulder at this other thing you mm. know as they're trying to and it's just the different cultural background and expectation it is it's a different it, different expectations different tastes mm -hmm. absolutely but it's it's quality as mm -hmm. well that you can tell poor quality um, synthetic fibers as well, uh, synthetic colors, but you don't, I think the market and, and consumers now are, are more interested in purchasing, not necessarily heirloom pieces, but high quality pieces that they can really use in their everyday life, as mm -hmm. opposed to purchasing essentially a souvenir that will get packed away in their home and never really used. Very few are going to actually be displayed or used. Right in a practical way. So I also, I mean, walking down the street just now that I see women, I, I would love to buy just to buy, mm -hmm. but I don't know that I'm doing any, I'm, maybe I'm giving them a bit more push, you know, stimulus that day, but am I really doing anything for myself that I'm investing in something that I'm not actually interested in? Right, well, and it's, it's reinforcing the, the lesser quality as the well in the quality. marketplace. And producing more of 
really those industrially produced, you can tell a yeah. handmade piece a mile away compared to a machine made or a synthetic piece or mm -hmm. even an imported product. Be very careful about the tags. Yeah. You know, they'll tell you everything about where that product actually comes from. Uh, so that was my work with Thread to Peru, mm -hmm. um, essentially being an intermediary, a consultant, uh, a sales representative. It was, it was a wonderful experience. I couldn't be more grateful for it, that it, it was a culmination of everything that I was interested in when beginning my career and now continuing it as well, that it was, as you said, the foundation for what I am doing now, which is pitching and focusing on natural dyes. So what was it that had you step away from that group that you were doing and start your own business with Pachinko Fibers? Well, it was, so I was with that to prove for four years. I had anticipated being with them for one. Um, and my team, be I became very close with my team. We were a small team, large network of artisans, small management team, as uh -huh. tends to happen with yeah. nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, my boss, Ariana Svensson, who is an Australian woman, greatest inspiration of my professional career. We're still very close. But textiles are a difficult market. That the difference between, you know, I can, uh, maybe not rant, but I can rave about the quality of Peruvian backstrap loom textiles, the stories that they tell, the, the women and men that make them, the time that goes into them, mm -hmm. you know, this uh, this they really and the ancient practices that we have archaeological historical records of going back to three thousand years, you know, really is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. The prices are high. The production time is long in exactitude. If you are looking to uh, standardize colors or produce something to spec, very difficult. Um, so I found that. Although we did very good work, and Thread to Peru continues to do very good work, um, our impact was not reaching, like we weren't having as deep of an impact on the daily lives. You know, we wanted to benefit the economic circumstances of the families that we were working with, and it wasn't as stable, it wasn't as steady or constant or reliable as I thought it could be. So mm -hmm. I started to think about well, what is a product that, because it is, it's innovation. So, you right. know, the, of being um, an entrepreneur, it's finding innovative solutions to systemic problems that, you know, we have this um, abundance of talent, which is true, mm -hmm. um, women with uh, extraordinary capabilities when it comes to artisan products, whether that be textiles, dyeing, spinning, mm -hmm. yarn, etc. Uh, low education levels, so looking at that, um, and needing to find a product that they could make that actually has a market that would support a better lifestyle. And it's not to say that money, like, you know, I was listening to a podcast this morning, actually. I should name drop, but I'm not going to remember it. <laughs> but it was about, you know, money will, like, money doesn't make you happy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's at a certain threshold that, you know, if you're already stable economically and yeah. you continue to earn and earn and earn, that additional surplus income might not make you happy. But earning enough so that you are comfortable and that you're right. not worried, that's what I was more interested in. Mm -hmm. In taking what they were, you know, maybe a desk job is not the answer for Santusa. Mm -hmm. Dying yarn, a practice that she's known for mostly her entire life, you know, fibers as she understands intrinsically really is just a part of who she is. That's a really viable solution for professional development and economic stability, mostly for, I mean, I focus mostly on women, but for families that don't have many job opportunities mm -hmm. and that yarn is a huge market. Yes. I'm not, I've become a big knitter. I love to knit. I'm not a crocheter yet. I'll get to all the techniques eventually. <laughs> but I knew that high quality yarn was a big market. Mm -hmm. Local yarn shops, designers looking to work with natural materials and organic colors. I mean, the opportunity is there and no one else was doing it. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say the idea was mine, but I ran with it. And we did a Kickstarter campaign in 2017 for the initial capital. Uh, our goal was 25,000. We hit 25,000 in 12 days, and then by the end, reached a little over 30,000 to start the business with. That's amazing. With about 350 individual backers, mm -hmm. majority of whom I had no idea who they were. So it wasn't a family, friend, right. back. People had heard about it. Opportunity. Uh -huh. 
there was an interest. People wanted to invest in this because the product that we were going to make is something they wanted to buy. Yes. And I know we've talked about this before. My first trip here six years ago, I spent the whole trip you couldn't find yarn. <laughs> looking for yarn and couldn't find yarn. And I thought, but this is Peru. It has such a rich textile tradition and I could find finished goods. And a lot of them at the time were synthetic products. Um, it was very difficult to find wool or alpaca made products that weren't uh, that were handmade, that weren't machine made. Mm -hmm. You could find a lot of machine made alpaca at the time, but not. And finally, the last day at the textile center, the, the little museum here in Cusco, I finally found some hand spun. And so we actually met through the online International Fiber Festival. I decided yes. to do Peru and I thought, well, how am I going to find yarn? And that was one of the yarn. only ones that replied, I think. I, <laughs> I can't find yarn in Cusco, thank how heavens. How could I not find yarn in Peru? So, but, but I was so happy when I found you because I thought, yes, someone's finally doing this there and bringing it to a larger marketplace. So, I, I mean, it's, it just seems like such a, a no, you know, I hate no brainer, but it really seems like such a no brainer that someone here would be producing hand spun or hand dyed or both yarn for, for the local tourism that comes through and also for the larger, mar larger uh, marketplace through the world. And you're actually in every continent that has yarn stores, basically, <laughs> you are represented. It's gotten, it, it grew and it grew very organically. I don't do much mm -hmm. marketing. I don't do much promotion. I really don't have the time. And it's not to, you know, it sounds self-important. It's just that Pichinko has grown to a level that it's hard to maintain for just one person. Right. That the girls do production. That uh, right now, Angela and Zantusa, you know, are, because everything with COVID that we've had to take mm, a step or two back. Right. Make sure that we keep the ship afloat. You know, ship goes down, we all go down. Right. So to be cautious, but they handle production. Everything else, the administration, export, finances, uh, sales, social media, website, I do myself. So mm -hmm. it, it grew on its own, which is great. Uh, I would like to see greater consistency from, you know, repeat, buyers, repeat clients, which we do have quite a lot, but I'd like to see more. But the challenge is that natural dyes are still really new. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're much older than well, acid dyes yeah, or organic super dyes. Super old, but are, they're new they're, as something that customers are looking for. Yeah, the elevated, I, it, a, a slightly higher price, mm -hmm. um, a different way to care for the product, you know, the finished product whether it be something that we made with naturally dyed yarn or that you'll make with naturally dyed yarn um, or fabrics, you know, it is a little bit more, uh, it's not even really that much more time consuming. Cause you think, you know, if you have a hand knit or hand knit sweater, you don't toss it in the wash, you hand wash and you lay flat to dry. Right. Yeah. So I say the only difference in caring for natural yarn or naturally dyed yarn is to use a pH neutral detergent and there you go. But it has been difficult to break into the market in a very steady uh, repeat, like buying in larger quantities. And we do, mm -hmm. I, we're just so blessed to have the clients that we do that not only love the product, but they love us, which is great that we formed a connection. I'm not interested in business that's just a sales transaction. Mm -hmm. I want to know the people, I want to share what we do. So that's been great, but yeah, we have, we've made our way around the world yeah, so far. Yeah, it's amazing. Yes, yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. Uh, being able to, <laughs> Knowing that the languages too, I mean, Spanish has been a huge plus that I think a lot of businesses or foreign owned businesses in Latin America suffer if they're not able to communicate in Spanish or mm -hmm. Portuguese or French. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's been a big plus on our side that we've been able to really open up to a Peruvian, Chilean, um, Colombian, etc. market mm -hmm. because of the Spanish component as well. So we're doing actually, I mean, our best clients are in Chile, which is... Oh, wow. Amazing. That's wonderful. Yeah, we love them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we love them. So it's been it's been good. So it's been very reassuring in in that sense. Uh, last year was really hard. You know, last year was really hard. Yeah, I think. And everyone was everyone. really struggling last year. Yeah. Very strange sense of community mm -hmm. with COVID that we're all struggling. Whether that be emotionally, financially, etc we're all you know we're all just trying to get through in our own way and you know businesses whew, especially small businesses 
businesses in Cusco, Peru. <laughs> That's a remote place to be working. Yeah. So having our doors open is, is a huge blessing still. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you want to tell us about the ladies? Yes. And how I'm really yes. interested in how you, um, well, I'm interested in them and their story and how they learned these wonderful techniques and skills that they have, but also I'm really interested in how you got connected with them. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that there, I, I can't imagine, particularly with Santusa, who's our production manager, mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine my day to day life without her. But I've been in Cusco for a little over eight years, and I've been working with the girls for eight years. Mm -hmm. So essentially from the so very from beginning. The beginning. So were they part of the textile group that you were working with before? They were. So they were part of a weaving association, a weaving cooperative from their home community mm -hmm. um, that they were living in Totora, I mean, really in the in the region of Atapamba, which is close to our workshop, just okay. going up the valley. Um, they were part of a weaving cooperative that I was working with through Threads of Peru. And they are truly, but without exaggeration, to, well, the whole group of women from Pichinku are some of the most talented weavers in Peru. Mm -hmm. I, I really would put it on the table that they, they're just extraordinary. And really their family culture as well, it, it, it was very welcoming. I, I have been to their homes many times and, and I felt not just a professional connection but a personal relationship with them. So mm -hmm. when it came down to starting Pichinko and I had told them, you know, about this idea of, you know, I'd really like to do some naturally dyed yarn. Well, when I came back with the funding, that's when the idea really concretized and that we were speaking the same language, figuratively speaking, right. uh, of, well, let's get this started. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. So we actually, uh, Angela and Santusa are our sisters. Mm -hmm. um, their younger sister, Leonarda, as well, uh, worked with us. And then essentially a sister-in-law. <laughs> Not by marriage yet, but generally oh, speaking. Close enough. <laughs> close enough. Uh, Francisca um, has been my team up until now. Um, yeah, I've described it before as a teacher with her students that, and I was really the student, but you know that in this wide network of 150 artisans that I was working with through Threads of Peru, they were just star pupils. They they really stood out from the crowd, and I know that I knew that in building it, I could really they were an excellent base. Mm -hmm. you know, they were going to be, they're very driven, very motivated, um, very innovative as well. Um, so I knew that that would be that would be a good place to start. Um, Angela, the oldest sister, there's five siblings. I don't work with two, I work with three. So the majority okay. of the family. <laughs> Angela, the oldest sister, still lives in Totora. Um, so she commutes down to the workshop um, throughout the week. She has three children. All are wonderful, lovely. Um, Santusa has a small plot of land in Calca, which is in the same town where our workshop is. Okay. Um, and she's built a house there. Uh, she has five children, all also wonderful. And her husband, Gregorio, also helps us at the workshop. Try to find... Even, and maybe at another point we'll get to how we source the dye plants, but, you know, finding ways that you can support, maybe not with a direct, you know, contract of work, but mm -hmm. that we order dye plants from their cousin who lives in a region where that plant dye grows in their backyard, and that they work in agriculture, have an extra income by working with the plant, mm -hmm. so finding other ways that we can support. Uh, Leonarda is uh, currently... Selling cows, I believe, that she took a, a brief, she's taken a reprieve. She took a break from, from the company. The, she, took a, she took a break. Um, Leonardo has two children. And then Francisca, who is actually the youngest of the team, she's 27. Um, and she's working on textiles at the moment. So it was really through my, my, former, my former job, my mm -hmm. first job here, that I, I met them. Um, but through Pichinku that that we really became a family mm -hmm. that, I mean, it's definitely, it, it's very much my company. And, you know, there are times when, you know, the, let's say boss and employee roles do kick in. But for the most part, I think of it as an egalitarian workspace and that what we both, what all of us bring to the table is equally important. Mm -hmm. It's really like we couldn't make the yarn if it wasn't for their knowledge. We couldn't sell the yarn if it wasn't for mine. Right. 
So the collaboration is really what makes it a successful it's business. Teamwork. Yeah, absolutely. So they learned um, from oh, their mothers or their mother, I guess one they family, their did. mother initially. Is that they did? So uh, their mother, I'm gonna forget her name. She passed away many years ago when when the girls were young. Mm. I think Angela was about 14. And she really took over as you know the main caregiver of their family at that point. Mm -hmm. But they all have memories of working with their mom. I want to say it was Elisa. I'm going to correct myself at some point. Uh, but they actually they were living in a community uh, called Pachamachai at the time, which is where they were born and mostly raised. Mm -hmm. Very, very remote, hard subsistence living. Uh, even now in 2021, there's no road access. Mm -hmm. You get to a certain point and then you walk or you take, you know, a mule. Mm -hmm. It's probably much nicer. <laughs> uh, so very limited resources. Um, at the time, as, as, as I mentioned before, it was a utilitarian practice. It was a necessary practice to make clothing. Mm -hmm. So you wove to make clothing. And if you wanted to have more colorful clothing, you use dyes, and at that time, natural dyes were the only option that you had. And mm -hmm. in that region of Pachamachai, they had a, a real abundance of materials available that they would watch their mom worked with and dyed wool for their mantas, their carrying shawls, their pulleras, their skirts. Really wonderful. And then over the years that they have worked in, in Spanish would be artesanías, in, in artisan goods, mm -hmm. that they've worked in different companies, worked for different nonprofits, again, never on a contract, you know, employed basis, but that they were able to weave and that they were able to sell their textiles. And throughout that they've participated in different um, training workshops, uh, different techniques, using different plants. Mm -hmm. They've seen quite a, quite a few suspicious materials yeah being claimed as <laughs> natural yeah it's a um, honesty is is not seemingly the best policy with mm. uh, some of the culture because we've seen that you know a lot of textiles are are sold or marketed as natural when they're not yeah so we've really needed to be um and you know we have a higher level of scrutiny in terms of you know we get our materials ourselves or we have you know very you know, um, suppliers that are that we know and trust that we are using 100% natural. Um, we don't get anything in in powdered form either. That's always dangerous. So it's been a, a really a lifelong process of them learning not just to work with uh, natural dye plants, but also spinning. I mean, they're absolutely fantastic spinners. They make it look easy. It is not easy <laughs> spinning on a drop spindle. I've tried so many times. Not my forte, not something I'm going to try to be an expert at. Uh, they would have started spinning at about seven, maybe younger. Mm -hmm. And they do it deftly. They don't need to think about it. It's just, you know, the weight, the feel, the really inspiring. Um, and of course, with weaving as well, that, you know, it's been... Because Angela is, is nearing 50 and Angela is in her 40s. Uh, Leonardo is about my age. Wow, we have one in every decade. <laughs> That's crazy. But yeah, honing those skills over the course of many years. Now, though, with Pichink really pushing the limits as to what's possible, uh, exploring color palettes, exploring designs, you know, modern trends, you know, making custom pieces, that it, it's really a side proper to say a side hustle <laughs> the side hustle that we'll do like I don't sell textiles as a, I don't make a line I'm not a designer but mm -hmm. I can I can design textiles for someone custom pieces and it's been it's been really fun in terms of testing my understanding of these techniques and their ability to recreate or to create new things mm -hmm. Pichinko is a natural dyeing company mm -hmm. which means all your dyes are natural they're they all are. Uh, botanical with one exception, um, <laughs> where where do you get your dyes from? Where do they come from? Well, I I want to say that I'm committed to, but it's a commitment that has been developing over the past four years. That I was mostly interested in working with native Peruvian plants. Mm -hmm. 
um, open to the idea of working with plants that the girls didn't necessarily know or that I hadn't seen. Because I had done over the you know four years of working with the textile company, I did a lot of natural dyeing myself as well, dye workshops, it, it, you know, register not registering, um, um, documenting recipes, etc. So I had a really good base. So I wasn't. I wasn't averse to the idea of exploring new materials, but I really wanted them to be local. Mm-hmm. It was more sustainable that way as well. Uh, so a big one, you know, one of I'd say you know the maybe the number one best known natural dye is indigo, mm-hmm. and indigo is present in Peru. It's just not cultivated on on a commercial you know level. So to order, I don't know a single company that sells Peruvian indigo for natural dyes Mm -hmm. in enough quantity that would make it viable to work with. So we use other materials, uh, fortunately, that we have to get blue tones that are similar to indigo, but it's not at all the same process. Um, But I really wanted to focus on what what the girls have worked with and that they have a, a foundation working with, and also what's been used in the past because again we're very focused on preserving this knowledge right and by introducing new 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 we're able to develop but we also want to continue with um it what has been i mean what has come before so most of what we work with is harvested by us by hand Mm -hmm. Uh, some materials are really easy Uh, some plants can be found just around our workshop Uh, eucalyptus really common uh, the leaves that we use to make green which are called chica really thought of as weeds so nobody's upset when we come and take them <laughs> it also grows I mean there's you'll see it everywhere but from one time that someone points it out to you you see the plant everywhere yeah our tour guide uh, it, it took him a while for it to sink in that I'm really here for fiber and wool mm-hmm. but once it did he kept like pulling chilka and anytime you saw it, this is for dying wool. <laughs> oh, great. Chil- Thanks, Chilka. For, glad you reminded me. So I have that, me. like, stuck in my head now, Chilka. It's for yeah. dying wool. <laughs> very good. Very good. I'll continue to remind you those words will stick. Um, others that we need to travel a little bit farther, um, at, for example, koi flowers that we use to make yellow were just at the end of their season. Okay. Um, so we also need to harvest seasonally, which I, for anyone who works, who, anyone who has a garden, knows that plants are seasonal you have your perennials it'll come up over here but you don't always have flowers you don't always have you know the you know the material that we would use for right. the dye so we work seasonally so cool year fortunately can be dried and used at a later time so we try to harvest as much as we can at this time of year so that we have a stock to use until next april right when the flower will be available again and we'll travel about an hour to do harvesting trips like that, but we'll spend the full day out harvesting, get as, me- as much as we can. Try to- sometimes we'll make it into a competition. The girls <laughs> always win. I get distracted. I just get distracted, and it's really beautiful. I mean, I just it, it's a wonderful excuse. It's such a tempting excuse to get out of the office that you know, you're going to get office materials, work materials, um, but you end up spending an entire day out in the mountains. Fabulous. Uh, others that we have to travel four or five hours um, could be a one or two day trip um, and then other materials that we'll either purchase like cochineal mm-hmm. uh, cochineal is very common in Peru very common in Central and South America as well we purchase from a local woman I mean just a few blocks away mm-hmm. has a small quantity of prickly pear nothing like the huge uh, farms or I wouldn't say cultivating, but really big farms of cochineal uh, that they have a lot in, in Arequipa, drier climates. Um, so we'll buy that. Uh, also, we buy it as whole bugs. That's the exception, mm-hmm. the botanical dyes. Yeah. We use cochineal bugs. Uh, so we'll buy the whole bugs and grind them ourselves. Um, and for materials that are really just uh, not bothersome. But it's just not it's not it's not feasible for us to go and collect them ourselves that will work with uh, acquaintances family members that live in those remote regions can harvest those plants really easily that know them as well send really high quality mature plants and they can really just send them on a bus down to our workshop Wonderful. it's a very haphazard way of getting the things you need to produce your product mm-hmm. but we make it work yeah 
Now, the, the ladies have been working with these dyes for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Since they've been working together at Pachinku, has there been any sort of happy accidents with the dyes mm-hmm. or any new discoveries that they've made or, or any techniques that they've discovered together? Absolutely. I think it'd be hard to narrow it down. Truthfully, I, every day has been, because I mentioned to you the other day that there's no guidebook for right. creating a business like Pichinko. A natural dye studio working with indigenous techniques in the heart of Cusco, Peru mm-hmm. at about 12,000 feet in the Andes. So it was, I mean, so much exper- like so much experimenting and, and, and every day, you know, a lot of back and forth. I mean, the feedback has, has improved phenomenally over the past four years as well you know, there's a lot of a lot more talking going on which is great um, but before that they had worked mostly with uh, alpaca and wool mm-hmm. well now we work with alpaca wool wool blends uh, cotton we've done linen um, we worked with uh, merino and silk blend that silk is really finicky when it comes to temperatures mm. I mean they would boil I, mean, I won't use bad language. Uh, they, I mean, they would just boil to death their yarn because wool, I mean, the hand spun, tightly spun wool, it, it doesn't, you really can't damage it. Mm-hmm. And alpaca is a very bit durable fiber as well. Mm-hmm. Silk is not. Um, <laughs> as well, we need to learn totally new processes to work with cotton because mm-hmm. it's a cellulose fiber, right? And we didn't know that. Mm-hmm. So I had to do a lot of investigation and then where to find those materials in high enough quality and then, you know, learning together, you know, not me teaching, but learning together how to do it. Um, Also playing with different combinations. So one of the plants that we use, Quinta Cucho, that gives kind of this minty turquoise green that we have one on the table. Uh, We learned that if you use an alum mordant, you know, before, because it's a natural tannin, so, you know, it gives you this beautiful color and they've never used it with a mordant, I Mm hadn't either. And it comes out this vibrant lime green. Oh, wow. That at first I was really shocked by. I was like, that shouldn't, no, that's not what we wanted. <laughs> and embracing it as, what well, we, we have another color option. Right, yeah. And being able to play, I mean, they're, they're incredibly creative at this point and on a daily basis surprise me that taking cochineal, I mean, just combining the combination of colors, you know, thinking about, all right, this is what we want in the end, these individual materials give us these colors if we combine them. So we've been able to get, you know, dusty purple, um, almost like mauve tones by com- combining three different plants that we would have never thought to combine mm-hmm. before and using um, the water as, a, like, we've learned that leaving, you know, if we boil down walnut to like, boil it down in large batches and then keep the water in large tubs for a couple of weeks, it actually gives you a different range of colors than it would if it was used fresh. Oh, wow. All things that I didn't know that they didn't know, but as we do color development for different clients, as we experiment with new fabrics, mm-hmm. I've really been able to push the techniques and also our own capabilities in producing colors. Really exciting. And this is something that uh, you know, this experimentation Mm -hmm. that you can get a taste of if you come to Cusco because you do offer the hands-on workshops for people. And I was lucky enough to do that the other day and it was fascinating. Best Um, students we've had in a long time. Oh, not (laughs) saying critical of former students, but really just engaged and involved. And we really, we we focus on, because we never, I, I never thought tourism would be now with our new workspace, which is really mm-hmm. big and, and very accommodating, um, very open, that I thought more of doing more workshops of having, not necessarily groups, because big groups really don't work for a workshop like mm-hmm. that. We want it to be intimate. We want it to be personal. But yeah, we put you in a in an apron and gave you some gloves and you did the dyes yourself, which yeah, is what we want. Yeah, we had a great time. Uh, Santusa and I, we would you know measure it out and then have to strip the leaves off everything and smash it up and yeah. get it ready. and. It was fascinating watching her because even, you know, I don't speak, 
I speak Dora the Explorer level Spanish, mm. <laughs> um, and and her native language is Quechua. She speaks Spanish as well, but just like watching you two interact and and knowing that she and you were translate for us as well too, and just like hearing her comments like we're doing too much of this or this isn't you know no I'm not mm-hmm. doing you know just like she so clearly just understood by how things were going Mm -hmm. what needed to happen you know and I was just thinking about the years of experience that that requires to be able to just to just know you know how these natural dyes that you know you cannot control really unless you've had those experiences because it varies like the amount of water or the amount of sun that year can alter the the quality of the, the dye in the plant material that we're working with that Santusa was definitely taking into consideration okay we're working with 100 grams of baby alpaca right how much cochineal am i going to be putting in um i can use up to five liters of water or else the color is going to be too dispersed well, what i most love about the workshops in addition to sharing our practices is is the how we're able to reinstill value it was a mutual exchange of, of knowledge and, and understanding that we really value and appreciate what Santusa, Angela, Leonardo, these practitioners of mm-hmm. natural dyes know. Yeah. They didn't necessarily know that. There wasn't, you know, now that they're in a space that they're able to share and you know, they're very well, they're very well respected and they're listened to and... You know, that environment is, is really empowering and, and, and really illustrates how important, how fascinating, how unique this is and that it does have value that should be preserved. So there's definitely an exchange between the two parties that we're not just teaching, we're learning from our... Right. I mean, the questions as well that are posed, whether it's translated, whether it's asked directly, that you know, it... it gets the wheels turning again of oh wow that might be another possibility or why haven't we tried that yet that would be really cool Uh, but those interactions come so we're hoping i mean now peru is opening up more that you and adam have been able to make it even even in from when we first got here until the Mm. start of this week we have noticed a market increase in the amount of people here just in this last week so that was really heartening to yes. see. Well, Cusco, the, you know, the, the main force of income has been tourism mm-hmm. for decades. There was no tourism for you know, over a year, mm-hmm. and that's been devastating on the local economy. Um, and we want things to open back up because we do have such a beautiful space. And I think you know, it's a joy to share what we do and, and to host people there and to receive people there. So I definitely see that you know, moving forward in 2021, going into next year, that we'll be looking at having more groups, having more I mean, really small groups. A group for me, like a big group, is like six people. Yeah, because yeah, then we can I really. I think that would work well. Yeah, yeah then we can in really space keep have, in. Yeah. We can really like see because I want there to be that conversation. That every person knows each other. Yeah, get a group of twenty and oof, a lot of movement. Yeah. But to do a little bit of everything and really, I, I want to. I don't want to push necessarily. I want to carry what we have now into the future. If we weren't doing what we were doing, and there are other organizations as well that are dedicated, committed to these artisanal techniques, and and hopefully we'll see them still in 50 years. I really don't know. I I became very disheartened before, and now I see more promise in it, but Mm -hmm. I'm not investing in this. We will see them deteriorate, and, and we won't. It's such a rich, vibrant culture that we have right now, but the less we support it, and the less it'll thrive. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I think, I think it is, this is one of my soapbox things and I know it's not Mm. something that everyone can do, but I think it's really important that as we think about our just general vacations or, you know, what, what do we want to use some of our disposable income on is, um, is thinking about this hobby, this, side love that we have for for textiles and for crafting and think about ways that we can we can uh, enrich our knowledge through travel and making contact with these you know local experienced experts mm. in their communities where they are whether that be 
you know, Shetland or Peru or a Canadian village somewhere, you know, but to, to go to where these experts are and help, as you said before, help create value for them, help them understand um, just how important other people find their knowledge so that Absolutely. it's there is a financial market for it, first mm -hmm. of all, because, you know, I love... we. We lived in the Philippines for a very long time, and in the time that we were there, we saw the culture begin to, not begin, continue to develop um, and become more economically stable for people as we were there. And part of that was because children were going to school to become doctors and you know business people and stuff and to help their families out that way and lift their families out of poverty. And so mm -hmm. I have a great amount of respect for that, but we also have these important skills and knowledge that can also be something that the children can go into and preserve if there's a market for it. Absolutely. And that does mean, you know, looking overseas to buy some things. I know I, I t completely respect the buy local movement and that's part of preserving the, the knowledge in our own areas but also looking abroad to areas where this knowledge is um, under threat of disappearing and, and doing what we can to create the marketplace for it. But then also going to those places ourselves, learning directly from the experts, buying directly from the people making the things. I think all of this is important. And I know it's, you know, it's not something that everybody can do, but mm -hmm. for those of us who can, this is one way that we can help preserve this knowledge and, and create that marketplace for it. I couldn't agree more. No, absolutely. I think there are all forms of travel. There are all mm -hmm. kinds of consumerism, you know, purchasing. And I tip my hat to anyone who just wants to travel and eat really well and drink amazing wine and, <laughs> and see sites that don't necessarily have that much to do with the culture. I know that there's all kinds of travel. My idea is to present another option, is to contribute another option that really does have a beneficial impact. It's, it's something that at all levels embodies what I as a person try to do and bring into the world and, mm -hmm. and, and introduce to the world. It's a small effort, but it is my effort. And I don't think that there's any obligation. It's a really wonderful idea to, to invest, you know, consciously consume. If you decide not to, at least the option is there. Right. Before Pichinko, the option really wasn't there. It wasn't such, there. We have such <laughs> wonderful fibers. I mean, yeah. such wonderful fibers in Peru. Mm -hmm. And in terms of wool, we're much more limited. That it really, I mean, almost all of it is highland wool. It's, mm -hmm. it's a much lower quality than merino, than some of the rarer breeds that we see, particularly in, in Europe and in New Zealand and Australia and, well, everywhere except for Peru, which is devastating. And we do have alpaca. Now, alpaca is sensational and we do have cotton that's being mm -hmm. grown in, in, in larger quantities as well. So we're seeing that there's a, there's a wonderful, um, oh, it's just not available. I want to make it available. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's the other, you know, if, it, if it's an option, it's an, an available option, whether you choose it or not, I think the option is actually more important. Mm -hmm. you know, that we are developing unique um, conscious products I mean, if it has any beneficial impact whether it be to the environment or to the local community etc uh, cultural identity etc but you know it's doing something good right so pachinko there wasn't anything like it before so it's great that now there is you know something particularly for fiber artists and particularly for knitters and crocheters and weavers and spinners that we are nuts for yarn yes <laughs> and just imagine like the full package embodied into that one skein of yarn. Mm -hmm. You're supporting cultural preservation. You're, um, you're having a very small impact on the environment, if any, you know, knowing the way that we work. You're supporting women artisans who have never had stable work in their life. That's a skein of yarn. So imagine the possibilities with other products that if yarn can do that much and it brings us so much joy and so much creativity and mm -hmm. creating, I mean, that's what we should be looking to develop in the future. Absolutely. Do you have any goals or dreams for Pachinku that you're hoping for the next steps? I want it to be the fire capital of Peru. Just our small workshop, which it is. Like it's, 
It's crazy that people find us. You know, we have an Instagram account, which is fun. You know, to you know, dabble, which is great. You know, to share pictures of our daily adventures. And you know, the stories mm-hmm. are hilarious because the girls are hilarious. I mean, things that they do on a <laughs> daily basis that they have absolutely no idea are funny. <laughs> which maybe we shouldn't be laughing. I'm not laughing at them either. They crack up when you draw attention to it. But uh-huh. I'm just sharing that, that the community has really grown. And I would love for it to become one of the fiber, like the main fiber points in Peru. And that we really send shockwaves into the Cusco community by supporting more women. I want the team to grow. I really don't, when I think about the team growing for Pichinko, I really don't think about other foreigners. Mm -hmm. Which is not necessarily to my benefit because I really do need people that, you know, can do sales, international sales, that speak different languages, that they do not necessarily have a college education, but, you know, they have business experience, etc. But I really think about women. I think about the women here. Mm -hmm. I want to employ 50 of them. Mm -hmm. I want them all to have a wonderful opportunity. And I want to have an extended circle of weavers that will have, that will do more textiles and we'll do them in a more concentrated, focused way and that will open a shop at Pichingu as well, turn our garage into an exhibition space. Oh, that would be wonderful. And I mean, I don't... I think I built, and I, I've thought about this many times, Pichinko had a roof built over it in terms of growth from the very beginning because mm-hmm. I want it to be undis- artisanal. Mm-hmm. I mean, industrializing natural bags, you can only go so far. And if I were to think of doing 50 kilo batches at a time, I mean, just the scaling in terms of materials and plants that you would need to do that, I mean, we'd need to, I mean, flip it on its head, you know, yeah. create extracts and concentrations and tinctures, and you know, mm-hmm. we're not at that point yet. So I want to keep it small, but I want to have its reach and its impact be really big. So, and everything under the sun in terms of textiles, dyes, fibers, it's spinning, uh, workshops, I want to do it all. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna help you get there. I think. <laughs> because you do have a wonderful product too and that's I mean it's one thing to say all of this but you're actually backing it up with wonderful products your yarn is beautiful it's high quality yarn Um, I mean you if you if you are lucky enough to come and and visit Pichinku in person there is a wall of yarn just all hanging there, all the gorgeous colors there, and you just want to like walk and just run your hands over it. I know, I just fall just... into it, go on the floor and fall into it. It's, it's just absolutely beautiful. So, I mean, it's one thing to say that you want to do it, but you're, you're backing it up with a very high quality product that, as you say, it it is supporting these women in wonderful, multiple wonderful ways. And so it's hard to believe that with such a wonderful story behind it and a wonderful product that it's not going to see the growth that you imagine. I certainly yeah. hope that for you. I, th- I think that you have made a fantastic start along the path. Yeah, it's been an exciting four years. And again, the, the third, no, well, this past year, you know, with the pandemic, I still have so much faith in, in the work and you know, the mission and the values because we're still here. Mm-hmm. You know, we made it through. And I think being small has been, you know, a strength in, in weathering the storm, which is great. And I always see room for improvement. But I think the biggest thing is, you know, it is a, it is a high quality product and it's supporting. I think that there's so many, I think that this population particularly, you know, I, I really know Cusco. You know, I wouldn't mm-hmm. project it onto the whole country or to anywhere else in the world. I think that there's so much potential, but we're not focusing on what they're, their strengths are. Mm-hmm. What do they know? What can they do well? There, it, there are opportunities for that. So seeing that the girls feel empowered, that they feel challenged, safe mm-hmm. as well, there's just so much more to it. So if it continues to grow or if it stays where it is or we just muddle through, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. And it won't be the last thing that I do. I know it'll be the first, and I'm learning a lot as, as I go. Mm-hmm. Can you tell people where all they can find Pitching Poo mm-hmm. Fibers if they want to find more information? 
Yeah, so we have our website, which is very poorly maintained. I'm so sorry. Uh, that's my fault. <laughs> our Instagram as well, that is, is, yeah, has a wonderful community around it. And those are both uh, Pachinku Fibers. Pachinku Fibers. Dot com, and then just Pachinku Fibers for Instagram. Exactly. And then our list of stockists and, and more information about designers that are working with our yarn are also available on those platforms. Okay, and we will have links in the show notes for all of that. And I encourage everybody to go check them out because it really is just a beautiful, beautiful products with a fantastic thank story you. behind it. So thank you, Dana, for joining thank me today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you again to Dana Blair for taking the time to meet with me for the interview. We had actually planned on doing the interview on the same day as the dye workshop, but we ended up talking so much not on tape that we ran out of time to talk on tape. So she made the trip to Cusco later in the week so we could sit down together again. That is dedication, my friends. (laughs) If you find yourself in the Cusco area, you need to contact Pachinku about a dye workshop. You have the opportunity to learn from master dyers and it should not be missed. In the meantime, you can find their yarns at pachinkufibers.com. A few more things before I go. First, this is our last reminder for the Hat Not Hate Knit Along that we are doing through the month of May. Knit a blue hat to donate to this anti-bullying organization to use during their anti-bullying school assemblies. Post a photo to the Facebook group or on Instagram using the tags Hat Not Hate and I Thought I Knew How. U.S.-based listeners, if you do this, you will be entered to win $50 of natural fiber Lion Brand yarn sent to your door. International listeners, please knit hats along with us. It's up to you whether you knit blue hats for Hat Not Hate and mail them in, or if you want, you're welcome to knit hats for a local charity and contribute them there. Post on social media as well, and you will be entered to win a PDF of Top 24 Morehouse Tops to Cover Young and Old, which is a $69 value. It is full of sophisticated patterns and silly patterns and utilitarian patterns for hats. You will never need to buy another hat pattern. This one book from Morehouse Farm will have you literally and metaphorically covered. And one last reminder to visit I Thought I Knew How slash Shetland to join us on the tours coming up in August. People have been asking me if we will be visiting other places. My hope and dream is that this does continue to grow. We start with Shetland tours and those stay and we add another country the next year and it stays and we add another the following year and it stays. So if you've been to Shetland and you want to go somewhere else to learn about the local fiber crafts and production and have a good time with fellow fiber crafters, let me know and I will start looking into it. Currently, with mom commitments and life commitments, adding one trip a year feels manageable. Spoiler alert, the second trip for next year is already in the works. I should have more information to share with you about that soon to soon-ish. Okay, everyone. Thank you for listening and knitting with me for a bit. If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash I thought I knew how to make a monthly pledge. You may also consider making a purchase from one of our sponsors by visiting the website I thought I knew how.com and clicking the link at the top that says be a booster. While you are on the site, you can also find the show notes for each episode. Thank you ever so much to my patrons, Mitt New Haven and Morehouse Farm for sponsoring the podcast. Find me on my social media accounts as I thought I knew how, except on Twitter, where it's just thought I knew how. The groups on various platforms are all called I Thought I Knew How Podcast. Until next time, may you be blessed with stitches that never drop, yarn without joints, and plenty of time to knit. Knit.